Uh, so we're um, doing a kind of a sermon series here about calling, about your calling, how God has called us into the world to do, to do his work, to be his people, and to be who God wants us to be. Uh, to that end, I'm going to read a little bit before and after uh, our gospel reading. This is John 13. Um, I'm going to start at 12. I'm going to go for a little bit here. Uh, it, it picks up where Monday, Thursday left off. Right? I, 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 let me back up even more. Some of you may not realize we are actually still in the season of Easter, right? which is why we've got the white here. Uh, Easter isn't a day. It didn't just happen on Sunday and then it's over. It's an entire season and it goes till Pentecost. Uh, and so this is, this is after Jesus had washed their feet and had put on his robe. He returned to the table and he said to them, Do you know what I have done? You call me teacher and Lord and you are right, uh, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example, that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their masters, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. Not if you think them, not if you wonder about them, if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But it is to fulfill the scripture. The one who ate, with my, ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I tell you this now before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Very truly, I tell you, whoever receives one who sends me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Obviously, Jesus is talking about people going out in his name. Uh, and he's also talking about Judas. Did you catch that in there? Uh, that there are some that just won't be chosen. Uh, and this is what I want to talk about. I want to get a little serious today. I know I like to have fun, uh, but today I think I want to be a little serious. Uh, we've been talking about your call in the world. And we've been looking at Peter, uh, the great loser for Christ, and uh, Paul and his awesomeness. And today I want to talk about Judas. I love Judas, and I don't think Judas gets enough play in the church. And I, I don't understand why. Uh, Judas is an amazing character for who he is. Uh, and I believe that Judas was supposed to be the best. Judas was supposed to be the Paul. He had everything lined up to be the Paul of the church. Uh, he was a zealot. He was a rebel. He was impetuous, driven. Uh, he, he, had, uh, he had money, had control of the purse, so we understand uh, the flow of power uh, through money. Uh, and he wrestled with his vision, uh, aligning with God's vision. Uh, and that never really kind of coalesced. Uh, and Jesus understood that Judas had flaws. We all have flaws. Judas had his own flaws. And God knew that he had flaws. Which is why in, uh, in verse 8, just a little bit even before what we read, he says to Judas, go, do what you're supposed to do. Jesus knew that this was going to be how it was going to be, that Judas couldn't do any other way. And it's interesting, uh, and I, I, I want to take a second here and, and talk about what Jesus was doing there. Because he knew what Judas was going to do, which was to perpetrate evil. And I want you to understand that God doesn't work through evil. That's not how God chooses to work in the world. He doesn't say, hey, I'm going to use evil to make good. No, he, he understands that people will do evil. We will do evil. But even though we do evil from our evil, good can come of it. And so he, he, he set Judas on his own path to do what Judas would. And the problem is that Judas limited himself. Uh, he put himself in a box. And he wasn't willing to see that there was another way that wasn't his way. It had to be his way. Judas had this vision about how God worked in the world. He was a zealot. He was a rebel, which means he was expecting that there would be a revolt. That, that, that the Roman oppressors, in his mind, would be overturned by a messianic king who would come. He understood, or he thought he understood, that the Bible said that there would always be a Davidic king. And the king is a king, right? How can you have a king if you have a Caesar? You can't. So he was expecting somebody to come in and lead a rebellion with swords and shields and spears to overthrow Rome, to be a king. And this was his idea. And when Jesus wasn't living up to that idea, he just, he couldn't see it. And he couldn't get with what God was doing. And he kept banging his head against what he understood to be the case. 
And we've seen this before. Peter did the exact same thing. Peter was a zealot. He had the exact same worldview that Judas did, that, that there should be this Messiah to come and overthrow Rome. And that's why Peter's the greatest of all losers, because while he was trying to put his idea of what the world looked like out into the world, and it wasn't fitting, eventually he said, all right, I just got to go with God. And he did. And he became an apostle and a, a, a foundation for the church that God has built. And Judas... Never made it through that breakthrough. Jesus knew that Judas had these problems. He knew that Peter had these problems. He knows that we all have our own idea of what, you know, what should church look like? Oh, it should look like this, right? What should, what should it look like in God's world? What should it look like this? What does God want you to do? It, it looks like this. It doesn't look like this. It looks like this. We all have these ideas in our head. The apostles were no different. Judas was no different than you or I or anybody else. And God knew that. Jesus knew that. And he said, hey, you know what? You need to come with me. Come alongside with me and watch how I work. Watch what people do when they get into my presence. Watch what happens when the goodness of God just outflows, outpours. And, and Judas saw that people just came to Jesus. They like pulled roofs out so they could have a conversation with him. So Jesus might be able to bless him. And Judas saw all these things just like every other disciple did, just like all the apostles did. And you know what happened? He couldn't get it into his brain. He had this small-minded God. His God was small. God had to work in this way. And if God didn't work in this way, then it wasn't God and God wasn't working. But somehow Judas still went through the motions. He still traveled around. Judas had the purse, so we understand that he took track of the money. Probably did the buying. Had relationships with merchants to get things. In fact, because he had the purse, he probably had a lot of relationship with people who were in need and destitute. He was the one who was bringing the goodness into the world. God put him in the position where he would be the most good. And Judas still couldn't understand how God was working in his life. He saw that he had all these talents, Jesus did, and he put Judas in the position to do this. And it never took. He couldn't get any ideas out of his brain that, that God might be working in some other way than he had fathomed. And so he betrayed Jesus. God gave him so much. He gave Judas life. We all take life for granted, don't we? <laughs> that we should exist, we just take for granted. We shouldn't exist. There's no reason we have to exist. We just take it for granted that we exist. And Judas had more than just existence. He had safety. All this Roman oppression, yeah, that created peace in his world. All this Roman oppression, that created prosperity. It meant that traitors could come into his world. What did Judas do all day but hang out with Jesus and feed the poor and see miracles? Oh, tough life, Judas. But he never counted his blessings. He just took that he had a good life for granted. No famine, no war. The oppression he was talking about was the biggest and most free estate in all of the Roman Empire. He had money to do what he wanted with. He had responsibility. He was someone special who was with the most special person, but he was selfish. And he hoarded it. Even, even remember when Jesus had the, the nar that was put on his feet? Even at that moment, right before Jesus' death, what did Judas say? Hey, we could have used that money to go and do other mission work with. He just had to hoard it. He just had to have it. Why? Why did Jesus not just slap him and say, hey, man, that money was given to you from God. How come you shouldn't just be okay with what it's being used for? Oh, yeah, and by the way, I'm going to die a horrible death. Don't you remember saying that? I've said that like five times. He was in this great social group of people who were watching something amazing happen. He had friends. He had men that he could love and trust. He had women who were around him. They had a wonderful way of, of, of acting and being with each other. And instead of getting involved, instead of being a part of that community, instead of getting the blessings that is being a part of that community, he kept him at arm's length and he didn't get involved. And he didn't have anything to do with him. You ever been in a place where you're with your buddies, or your friends, right? People that you really love. And, and, and you're, you're having a good time, right? Maybe you're having some wine or, or just some coffee 
or, or, you know, maybe you're just having a nice meal, and everybody's talking, and you're all telling stories, and you're laughing, and you're telling jokes, and, and maybe, you know, you, somebody gets up, and, and you say, hey, wait, where are you going? And they say, oh, i got to go to the bathroom. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, people have to use the bathroom, right, right? But you were in such that moment right there that that person leaving left a hole, changed the chemistry of the event so much that you just, hey, wait, where are you going? Well, Judas gets up from this table, from this special meal, right? This is the Last Supper. This is a religious event that they've all been looking forward to, that they've been doing since they were children. So it's got all this significance. You don't just get up from the, from the, the Thanksgiving table and walk out. Who does that? So you got this, this, this big religious event, and then Jesus has already built it up. If you've paid any amount of attention to what Jesus has said, he says he's about to go and die. And so this is the meal where they're going to be with Jesus for the last time. And Jesus is talking about them, and then he gets up and he goes, and nobody asks him where he's going. If you read the Bible, they, 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 they make guesses about where he might be going. They guess. They guess. They don't even ask him. Hey, Judas, hey, where are you going? No. No, because he's really not a part of the community. He comes and he goes, and nobody really knows. And where does he go? He goes to these priests, these Sadducees. I mean, I can't imagine somebody that I have spent you know, years living day in and day out with, leaving my presence and not asking where they were going. And if they did go somewhere, you know, you, you go with them. This is the time and day and age. It's not like you went down to the quickie mart, right? It took them a long time to walk into town, to have that meeting. Somebody would have gone with them, a friend, somebody. I mean, you go to the bathroom with a friend. How come you're not going to go on a long journey with a friend? And he didn't. Because he didn't have the connections. He saw it. He was all right there in his midst. And he didn't bother connecting. And he didn't have the connections. And so he went to go betray Jesus. He didn't understand what God was doing in his life. He didn't honestly, earnestly commit to the way that Jesus was laying out in front of him. And so he betrayed Christ. And this is the most amazing thing to me. And right before he does it, the one guy who knows he's going to do it and recognizes that he's going to leave is Jesus. Jesus gives him that piece of bread and he says, go. Go do what you're going to do. Jesus knew that this was going to be for his detriment. He's going to die this way. And that this evil was going to come on him. And Jesus said, go. And this is why it's so amazing. This is why Judas was supposed to be the greatest of the disciples. Because it was supposed to happen that way. It was supposed to be that Judas was going to be small-minded. It was supposed to be that he was going to be standoffish. It was supposed to be that he was never going to be a part of that community. And then when Jesus died, and all of that evil came on him, and then he came back from the dead, and he rose, and he's standing in front of everybody, Judas was supposed to stand at Jesus' feet and kiss them and cry and beg for forgiveness... And Jesus was going to pick him up and hug him and kiss him and say, you are forgiven. And then the whole world would know. If God can forgive this guy, then he can forgive me. That there is nothing in the world that couldn't be forgiven. If you could forgive this guy, this guy who killed Jesus, if you could forgive him, then you could forgive anything. Our God is so amazing. But Judas couldn't do that. And when Jesus died, he looked and he said, well, now there's nothing in the world, is there? And he killed himself. You see, Judas had lied to himself so much. He told himself so many lies about what the world was supposed to look like instead of looking at how God was in his, his life. And he told himself so many lies about who he is and what he's supposed to be in this world. And then when it didn't pan out, Satan grabbed him by the ear and told him one more lie, which is what suicide is. Now the good news here is that even in that lie, where Judas took the worst case scenario upon the worst case scenario upon the worst case scenario. Our God is bigger than Judas knows. And even in that situation, in death and in suicide, our God is loving. Our God is infinitely loving. And Judas may yet still be loved by God. Because that's our God. He is bigger than anything Judas ever understood. 
that nothing separates us from the love of God. That it could have and should have and would have been Judas's glory to God had he repented, but he didn't. He didn't get involved. And I think that it's important that we get a little serious today and we look at what happens when the other way is taken. We talk a lot about how God works in our life. And we, uh, we have a class, a class that I hope everybody attends, this authentic faith class. And the job in that class is to find out how God is working in your life. This is the very thing Judas didn't do. That's why I want everybody to take this class. So that you might listen to how God works in your life. So you might be able to identify those ways that you're, you're lying to yourself, that you're shortchanging the Holy Spirit in your world. So you might not hoard your talents, your resources, your wealth, your time. Look, how, how much talent do you have? More than you think. How much wealth do you have? More than you think. How much time do you have? More than you think. But what do we tell ourselves? Constantly we tell ourselves, I don't have time for that. I can't do that. Ain't nobody got time for that. I can't afford that. I can't do that. Tithe? Nobody tithes. What are you talking about? What's a tithe? I'm not capable of doing that. I don't know how to teach. I don't know how to preach. I don't know how to play. I don't, I don't have the courage. I don't have the, the understanding. I don't have the, I don't have the. These are all the lies that we tell ourselves. And that's going the opposite direction. God calls us to be a part of his glory. Not to be his glory. To show it. In Judas's weakness, God would have shined more brightly than maybe he would have with any other person ever. Even more than Paul, perhaps. But it would have taken Judas' understanding that his weakness is God's strength to get to that point. And Judas couldn't get there. So I want you, I want you to recognize in your weakness that nothing will separate you from the love of God. And that in your weakness... You can be a part of the love of God and show his glory. Don't let anything stand between you and God's love, especially you. Thanks be to God.